cool. Hey, I'm Daniel Prin. I am a staff writer with the Movie Buff, and I am one of the hosts of the Movie Buff Show. I am joined today by Arpit Nayak, one of my colleagues, and we are also joined by Raj R. Did you just want to introduce yourself, Raj, and just your role on the film? Hi, I am Raj R. I wrote and produced a Tamil film back in 2007, and then I wrote, directed, and produced the Telugu film, Malaysian, in 2019. And Nitin was the sound designer on the film, and I liked this story. And then I produced uh, his Malayalam film, Paka, uh, this year. Uh, so this is my brief film uh, career introduction. OK, awesome. And we're talking today about, so how do I say it, Malasham? Mal- Malaysian, yeah. Malaysian. It's the name of the person called Malaysian. Okay, Malaysia. Okay, great. Cool. We're very excited to have you here today. Thanks. Arfa, did you want to start with your questions? Yeah, generally, I, uh, Raj, I love to ask this question, you know, as my first question. I, and your story, I think in a way I know, so is the, Daniel also know it, but I think our audience would love to know this, that uh, what inspired you to become a filmmaker and can you tell us a bit about your journey so far? Sure. It's a... Uh, uh... I mean, the writing bug was there from college, uh, wanted to pursue filmmaking, but then I got a software job. I thought I'll have to take it, but this was always going in my mind and I used to write it, but I didn't know how to uh, go around it, like how to whom to approach once you have the script, right? So uh, either in the South industry or Hindi or anywhere, I didn't have it. I didn't know whom to approach. Uh, I was based in US. So then in 2007, I got hold of uh, a, an actor in Tamil and then I said, okay, I'll write, I have a script. I want to uh, produce it because no one else will produce it and let's do it. And and it was a Malayalam director, Jay Ratzer. He's a national award uh, winning uh, director. And, and though the movie came out well, uh, it was an unknown star cast. Uh, financially, it was a disaster. And I said, I'm not going to do anything related to film. So I'll just forget it. <laughs> and it was a bitter experience because uh, it's the, the movie itself, you can never predict it will be successful or not. Uh, and it's okay. I lost money and it took me four or five years to, uh, like, uh, to pay all the debts and to be debt free, it took me probably from 2007 to 2011 or 12, probably. But it's it's okay. I mean, the money part of it, you already know. You once you go in, you know, you might lose everything in a movie. But the thing is, at the time, the I mean, even now, probably some of the industries are like that, where you are a new guy, you have no clue. I mean, actually, I never wanted to be a producer. I just wanted to be a writer because no one would make my film. So I said, okay, I'll produce it too. And then it's the journey itself was bitter. That's the problem where uh, they'll say X amount, you can make it. And then once you get in, there is no organized filmmaking style, right? Like unlike maybe these days it's better. Or if you look at any other small template that how people do it in US or other parts of the world. There are cost overruns, but there is a professional way of making films. There are There is a planning, how much for each crew and uh, Then it was so haphazard and uh, someone will say, oh, it costs X, but now it costs two X. And then it's, it's crazy. So you start with the budget X and then it goes three X. So that's the, and there is a production managers and there is a crazy way of it. And somehow the movies get done, that's a different thing. But it's just, it's just the experience was bitter. And then the deaths after that, and it, it took me a while to get out of that. And then I said, it's okay. I wanted to write something I wrote. Uh, the reviews came out well, so I'm satisfied. Uh, there was a, probably a writing bug and I am done. And I was, I was at peace after that. Uh, but in 2016, 17, I watched a TED talk of Malaysia and someone forwarded me, I just watched it. And, and, and I connected to it at a, at a much deeper level when I watched it. And then I watched it again, second time, third time. And, and the authenticity with which he speaks. So typically the TED talks 
the, that from Hyderabad, they they're in English. So this was an exception where he can't talk in English. So they made it simple for him to make it talk in Telugu. Probably that was the first TED talk where where they allowed the speaker to speak in his uh, native language. And and then when I looked at it, I thought like why I connected to it was when when he failed to make a machine to help the women, uh, women's suffering. He had something in mind, he wanted to do it, and then he failed. And the difference was he, he continued further, right? So it, yeah, it, so he said, yeah, the first, show, first design was a failure, it's okay. I just tried a prototype and then he tried again. And then he went on for seven years and so many failures. So he did probably after his fifth major prototype work. And then that was after seven years. And then I thought, I thought a guy who, who, has, who has not completed like sixth grade education could have so much of uh, courage and determination to try again after failure. I don't think I should stop at one and I should try again uh, that. And, and the thing is, I didn't fail in the writing. I didn't fail in the, the output of the movie. I failed during the making of the movie. And I thought that's okay. That's one part of it. That there are so many positives to the first attempt as well. So I said, no, I think uh, it's, it's worth uh, making this film again because it inspired me. So at least, if not a lot of people, at least people who think like me will get inspired. So I knew the target audience is not like millions and billions, but at least people like me, let's just, uh, I'll just try to make it to people who probably will like it because I, I liked it immensely. I watched it like second time, third time. And then I wrote the film without even talking to the person. So for, for, for a few months, because most of it he told in an 18 minute video. So I know overall, What's the start? What's the end? What's the beginning? So I had something in mind. There is a reference. But there were so many other things that I can feel it. Like, how does failure look like? I mean, after failure, if you're completely low, how does it feel like? And after that, what, what do you need? Some kind of inspiration to come. All that I know, I can feel it, right? So part of it, I, I wrote my own experiences and... And then, then I talked to him, I bought the rights of him, got to know more about him, and then took other experiences, questions and all that, and then made it into a film. So, so that was the whole experience. And then, and, the, and while making two, this time the difference is, I knew, I mean, this is a risky thing too, I might lose the money. But the difference between my first film and second film was, in the second film, there were numerous obstacles to make it. But I, I really like the journey of the film, right? So, so, so that I was very keen on that this time, of course, there will be obstacles, there will be stress, there will be a lot of things, but I enjoyed the journey. In the previous one, there was only stress. I didn't enjoy the journey of filmmaking. Though I was producer and here the role is different. I'm a, I'm a director too. So there's so much of more creative uh, satisfaction. Uh, but uh, and so I went there, I went to the village and I stayed there for a year. So I quit everything and then I just lived there like one of them. And that's when I, I got a lot of other writing material. So it was primarily my crew. The, luckily there was this crew that I had, pretty much most of them were uh, first time, uh, let's say first time cinematographer, editor and all those people, but they had film school background. and. Uh, a lot of amateur stuff, just like me, like just like my, my crew was just like me and uh, all these people, but they lived there and lived probably more than uh, how, how much I stayed there. So even before the pre-production stage itself, they lived there. So then I joined them. So that year when we were there, more, more scenes we could write from the village because we are seeing the village life, right? So it's not like being in some city somewhere and then you are looking at it from outside. Here we were inside the village. So uh, just to give you an example, we were writing one day with the team and there was this small festival that happens. 
and all the crew went away and then they were dancing in there and they came after three, four, four hours. And I'm like, oh, wow, this is so intense in this part of the world. So let's incorporate some of the cultural aspects of it into the movie. So that's how those ideas came from the place. And after the movie, like a little bit of uh, some few people watched it and they said, it's, it's good enough. So all that I treated it as bonus. So the difference in my first film and this film is for first film, the focus was more on, okay, I'm putting a little bit more, a uh, little bit money, right? Will I be able to recover it? And these guys are taking me for a ride because I have no clue about the language. I didn't speak the language. I, I don't know about how the film production works and everyone is taking me for a ride. So that was the thought process, right? So, but here it was more about just let's enjoy this, this process of making a film with how much our honesty and integrity that I can make in terms of everything, not only just the, the writing part of it, the making part of it, how to deal with the people. It's not probably, I probably didn't give them luxuries, but how I treated them, right? With respect and everything. So, so that's what, the, that, that's why the whole journey was so uh, pleasant. Uh, and that is, doesn't mean there was no stress. Of course, every day was very stressful because uh, as you know, I mean, anything that can go wrong, goes wrong in a film, right? filmmaking. So, so those challenges were there, but it was such a pleasant experience. And all these were bonuses, like later people liking it was bonus one. Uh, I didn't make money out of the movie. I didn't recover my investment, but recovered uh, a lot of my investment, let's say compared to my first movie. So that, that I consider as bonus too. So I'm not, those were my end goals earlier, but those became bonuses. So that's the shift in, in, in this, the, the second film. And the third film, Paka White Happened, is, uh, see, all these guys helped me immensely, my crew, uh, with the movie. So. I know that for me to write my next one, I'll take a year or two to write, to plan and everything. So I thought whatever little money is left from there as a gesture of gratitude to my crew, I let them make a movie. And my cinematographer pitched a movie. Uh, there was an acting coach, there was a editing consultant, and then there was sound designer Nitin who who pitched this movie too. So when I went to Bangalore, when we were doing the 5.1 with him, was so tired and then he said, no, he has a movie. Then I looked at it. So the storyline itself was a typical Romeo Juliet kind of thing, but the preparedness he had, he had the music done and he was so clear about his scenes, how he would make it. That actually clinched the thing and said, well, just, just make it another experimental one where he can be a filmmaker too. So that was the thought process. It's not that I wanted to be again, a producer or something like that. So just as a gesture uh, to help one member of my team who helped me make my movie to make theirs. That's that's about it. So this this was my this my journey in the filmmaking. I mean, that's a great answer. I don't think so. I ever got such a, a, a perfect answer. I would say, you know, about the whole journey. Daniel, you would like to go ahead with your question? Yeah, sure. Very in depth. I enjoyed that. Listening to that. Um, you were kind of talking about like I feel like you covered a lot of like the research of the film and um, like how you first heard about Malish Malisham uh, in a TED talk. So what what was it like meeting with him? What was that experience like? See, that's that's uh, uh, like even when I was watching it, uh, he he was still a very humble and modest guy, right? And then when I met him. He, he got the fourth, uh, the top most civilian award from India. Like it's, it's, it's there, are, there is a top one, which is Bharat Ratna and then two and three. And this is a fourth, that's a top, the top four, fourth award that anyone can get. And he got that. And I don't see any difference between the person who has got it and who has who didn't get it. That was the key thing. So there were that, the personality, that is actually which attracted me to make the film that, okay, in spite of all this, he's just a very ordinary guy, lives in the same house, live everything. He does the same thing what he used to do before. And, 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 and that's exactly 
why it, it, it made me make the film even more, right? So when I met him, it's exactly the same thing. So those qualities I wanted to bring into the movie too, like the character itself, like before and after the movie too, I, his personality I wanted to bring in. And it was, a, it, I, I got acclaim and uh, criticism for the ending shot, which is he, uh, see there are two ways of looking at it. So yeah, people probably, they'll already know that, okay, he will make the machine, right? So after the machine, what are the celebrations and what this guy becomes, right? So there were two paths for me to take which is, see, when you make a biopic, I mean, different people have a different uh, uh, different thought process of how to make a biopic. Every person will have different, different things. Like some people will say, no, I'll just stay exactly to the fact. Some people will be like, oh, I'll just take a little bit and then do everything off my mind. And the way that, the, the way that I did was, I'll, I'll be honest to you everywhere where, where it's not necessary, I'll not change anything. I'll just keep it the way it is, it's very simple. But just wherever slightly, if I have to make it a more cinematic, because at the end of the day, I have, we have the job of a filmmaker is to engage the audience for the time that they invest in. So I have to make it a slightly more engaging, but when it's not necessary, I didn't touch it. So in the end, I had two options and I struggled with it for a long time. So in a typical, a Telugu movie or something, the hero after he wins, I mean, you got to show so much of high, right? Like, oh, he does that. And then his, his award, the fourth, the, the fourth highest award that he, that anyone can get in India, he gets that. And then you make him a superhero and all that stuff. So that was one, one path in front of me. The other was, yeah, he's happy. Uh, the whole villagers are happy. And then he just goes back to his normal work and is just doing his thing. And to, and, and each one had its, its pros and cons. But then finally I stick to, the, there's the normal ending because the person was like that. So I thought, okay, let me just keep his personality there. So to answer your question, those kind of finer things of how the character should be and how everything came from the person. Okay. Has, has he seen the film? Oh, yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, I mean, earlier, uh, when he got the award, it was like long back, like 2016 or whichever time, and no okay. one knew this person. He's not like a famous person or anyone there, even in the local place. Yeah, he got an award after that. I mean, no one knows. I mean, even during the award, it was just a mention in small newspapers and all. After that, it's not like a famous guy or something. Okay. So, so even when we met him and all, no one knows. If I tell him I'm making a film on this person, people are like, who is that person? So not in his place or in state or country, nowhere, no one knows about this gentleman. So yeah. of course, after this movie, I mean, it's like, it's overwhelmed with the, his popularity now in the, at least that, that region. And he, he is uh, very happy with the outcome. Yeah. Okay. But he, I mean, I made him watch during different, I mean, when I, uh, oh, it, it was a very interesting thing, actually. When I wrote the script, I also hired like three more writers to write their own versions of the script. And then I gave all the versions to him and said, you pick which, which version do you want to want me to make? Because okay. as a writer, I would say, oh, mine is the best possible way to write, but, but it's your life. There is only one chance you get for your life to be made into your film. So you pick which way you want and I'll, I'll make it that way. And then he looked at, and there was a session, a whole day session where I invited the three writers uh, and me and all of them narrated it. And then he read my whole thing. And then I said, Raj, I'll go with your version. So, 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 so he was part of the writing process and then when we made the movie, I first showed him, do you have any objections to it or any changes to it? He said one or two things. And then I said, sir, it is just for the film. Uh, it, I don't think it will affect you negatively. And then he got convinced. And so he was part of the thing, uh, for, part of the filmmaking in, in, to get his approval during writing stage, as well as like after the making thing. Oh, that's awesome.
And just talking about how he um, didn't get a lot of attention, like, until the film, like, I feel like it would be so weird, like, him searching his name on Netflix, and, like, it just coming up, like, just this big biopic about him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's Orville, you know, like, yeah. like, everywhere he goes, like, people ask about him, like, his, his award. So even when he got the award, like, maybe that day people announced it in newspaper and TV, but then they don't know, like, it's just XYZ there. It's not like a sports person or a star that people would remember him no one no one really knew no one knew anything about him uh okay. till the movie came out okay fair now even after also- the TED talk the TED talk had when i watched it the TED talk had like only 50,000 views at the time and other TED videos generally you get like so many right so that was 50,000 so only 50,000 people watched it so they would probably 50,000 would know about him and then towards the movie, when we made it, uh, it had like a million views. So, so that, yeah. So from 50,000 to, to a million was the, how many people knew about him. Uh, oh, that's awesome. And probably like a lot of those are your crew, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like audience, because after watching the film, they'll search for him, right? Then they'll yeah. like, oh. Because the, uh, I use the TED Talk as the climax of the movie. Sure. Uh, after the climax about him, I, I put the whole, like, like the highlights of the TED Talk. So that's why people will be like, oh, he's, was he in this TED Talk? So let me go and watch the TED Talk. So that's how it happened. Okay, very smart. Now, <laughs> I also really enjoyed how the film kind of opens up with the special thanks. And I noticed that you gave a special thanks to the Dallas movie buffs. Is, is there a story behind that? Oh yeah, so so this uh, it's it's oh that's interesting question that no one asked though. So it's 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 not like it's it's a very small group of people uh, who wanted to make a short film, and they spent like an year to make it, and it didn't work out for them. But they just remained friends, and these guys they love to watch movies and discuss about it, the meat and all that stuff. And I had no associate, and I've been living in Dallas for a long time from 2005, six. So it's been like 15, 16 years. But I have very few friends here, and especially people who like to discuss about movies. I, 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 I don't know anyone here. And they watch movies, but they won't discuss about it, like how to make it or things like that. So when I made the film, I had the rough copy. So some of the music and other things were getting done post-production. So I came back to meet my family and spend some time before I go back. Because as I said, it's like a year or two years process. So I was going back, spending it. But whenever there is downtime, nothing much happening. So I would come back, spend some time with the family. That's what I was going back and forth. So, so I was requesting a few of my friends. I have a, a, like just four or five friends here, close friends, uh, their families and all that. So I was requesting them to come and watch the film so they can give me some feedback, which I, which, because other people, uh, they might, like the crew and us, it's tough for us to judge a movie because we are inside it. So I was requesting these friends and they were like, yeah, we'll come tomorrow, day after. So I was waiting for like weeks. And these guys, I mean, if one guy would, come, would say, yes, he's available. Some other guy says, no, he's traveling or something. So it was not working out. Uh, and then I went to, I meet someone, uh, there is one gentleman who helped me with my dialogues to make it better. He was a creative consultant in the film. So he he flew to Dallas. So I went to meet him. And with him, there was this another gentleman. And he said, oh, uh, you're making this film? I said, yes. And then he said, can we watch it? And I'm like, are you guys serious? Because I've been begging my friends to come and no one wants to come for a <laughs> for to spend some time and give this feedback. And this gentleman is saying, He'll come. I thought he's maybe just saying it for just the sake of it. And then he calls me uh, later and says, how many can come? And I'm like, wow, I have this luxury of more people coming and give feedback to me. And so these guys came and like 11 or 12 people from this group and they watched it and they gave me feedback about uh, pretty frank people, what they liked it. Some people, some things they didn't like it. And there was this couple and their son who were interested and they helped me even edit it. So one, it was it was crazy. I never expected that this yeah. feedback would come from this group, which I have no clue. And they would come watch the movie. And because 
I was, it was, I was still cutting the movie. I used that feedback and uh, made the film better. So, so that was the history between the Dallas movie versus it's a small group of 10, 12 people. Oh, cool. I'm glad I noticed that because I, I like that story. That's awesome. <laughs> cool. Now, Arpit, did you want to jump back in? Sure. Uh, so, uh, Raj, uh, you know, you were just talking about uh, the biopic and everything and how uh, you were just a bit conscious about which ending you like to pick. So, you know, I have this, uh, I, I, when I was just watching your film, you know, so often the biopic that has been made, you know, uh, they sometimes uh, over-dramatizes, you know, that uh, so the audience will, can connect or let's say sympathize more towards the character. But in your film, we never see that, you know, it, it has that uh, right balance, uh, you know, we never see it going a bit overboard with the, the drama or anything. So how did you find this right balance between the reality and the cinematic reality? As I said, I was answering Daniel's thing that I stuck to the facts and took when, when I don't have to deviate from it, when there is enough drama in his life, I, and in his, in his, when he narrated the story and in his TED out, TEDx and other places, there was no need to dramatize it because the actual content itself was dramatized. Actually, in some places I had to tone it down because sometimes it was so unbelievable, some of the incidents. So, but, but the climax is where I wanted to give that cinematic high because the audience, after investing a time of like two hours, they want that high. I mean, it's, it's very natural for audience to have that high and then go with that move. So that's, that's why in all the films, the climax, uh, that's how it's made. But, but here, because the rest of the movie was realistic, the rest of the movie was, he was a normal guy. And in reality, in real life, he's like that. So it was a very tough decision to contain myself and, and uh, make it very subdued. Right, so in some places there were places where we could make him larger than life and other things and add a little bit of fiction, but it was a very, uh, it was a tough decision because uh, typically, especially the place where I made in Telugu films and all that, it, it might look like a very art house kind of movie and they would reject it outright. Uh, but frankly, there was criticism for the climax that, hey, we invested so much time and we wanted that high you didn't give us, but some people said, they liked it, the final final shot. Like after his whole thing is done, when you show it in one, there is only one continuous shot. You first see him, Malaysian character, uh, weaving, right? And then you, then the camera comes to the mom saying that the machine he made is for his mom. Now what is his mom doing, right? The mom is playing with the granddaughter, right? And you see the wife from there, she comes in, his earlier job was her job was to do the whole that that asu thing and now she switches on that light and then goes away and then in the background there is uh, the hero weaving it so it's father and weaving that they're still continuing their thing there is a relief to the mom there is a relief to the wife to do other activities so i thought it summarizes the whole thing though it's not larger than life and all that so but there was a fair amount of criticism for it that uh, it we didn't get that so but but that was a risk i had to take both ways there was a risk if i make it larger than life it comes as like just one or two scenes which are completely different than the rest of the movie and if i stick to the tone of the movie then some people would be would not like it so i took the risk and and frankly both it went both ways though some people uh said it could have been better if we would have made it slightly larger than life. And some people said, no, this was the perfect ending because we thought, I mean, you would mess it up here, but you contained it. So, so it was both mixed and that was a very tough decision to make. And I'm glad. I think it worked uh, well because I think uh, at the end of the day, he's an ordinary guy, you know? Yeah. I think uh, that, that, that uh, what uh, makes him what he is. You know, the simplicity that he carries. So I think uh, in a way uh, that what uh, something I love because fact, uh, anyone will know that, you know, that uh, yes, he has achieved it. He has got this award and everything. So I think uh, if, if you take my uh, personal opinion, I think I love that. Oh, thank you. Thank you.
Uh, one, one more thing that, you know, I, I loved in your film is that, uh, you know, the way you have shown kids playing in late 80s, you know, with the marbles and the whole yeah. these games. So while crafting that particular scene, where you're trying to showcasing that how the play used to be so simple at that point of time, you know, and what was the simplicity like back then and right. what's the reality now. So were you trying to projecting that while crafting that particular sequence? Right. So... Uh, as I said, majority of it I took from his scenes and everything, but where I have to transition between scenes, I use some of my own life experiences, right? So uh, whether it is his relation with his wife, relation with his mom, dad, kids, everything. So everything is about him, but unknowingly or knowingly, you, you try to associate with them and then you put yourself into those shoes and then your own experiences come in too. So when, it, when I interviewed him, he said, Raj, I mean, uh, the school part of it, when I dropped out, uh, when I was forced to drop out, I used to be okay because morning, I, my weaving used to start and then I used to do with my father. But it's when the school ends, that's the time when people would walk from my house about, they'll be like uh, playing and laughing and they'll talk about school. When I hear that, that's when, when it used, I just used to feel a little bit sad that, oh, I should have gone, I should have complete, I mean, continued too. Otherwise I would have been busy with, with this life. Um, and that was what he said. So that's a line, right? And from where every, everything else you build on, build around it, right? It's likely, of course, some fiction. And then when I wanted to show his happy part of it before this incident where he's forced to, uh, his continue his studies. Uh, I had to use my own experiences of how, you, how I used to play when I was a kid and that I don't see my daughter <laughs> playing it that way. Uh, that That's something that I think, oh my God, I mean, we used to have so much fun. I mean, whether there is money or not, I mean, how much we used to have fun and I don't see that in the current generation. And, and that's something from my own experiences, I, I, I brought, brought that stuff in. So that was very personal and in order to showcase, I mean, yeah, there was no money and there was not much, uh, many resources, technology and other things, but we were, we were very happy. And that's what I wanted to show there. That, I mean, I mean the, there is a problem that he has to solve, but the poverty part of it, I mean, uh, growing up too, I mean, uh, I never felt it as a kid because you, you have fun as a kid, right? There are so many games and you play, you don't realize it. So that that's so yeah, it comes from a in a way, I have got it right. I have got it right when I when I was just thinking that it was in a way to uh, uh, show the simplicity of that time and you know remind right. now that you know how, uh, like we could not have such fun, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And it comes uh, some of those kind of things come from some personal space. Uh, yeah. Daniel, you like yeah. to come up with your question? Yeah, I'll just uh, I actually had one that's kind of like similar. I mean, not similar, but just kind of like actually all about that scene, because that was one of my favorite like music kind of interludes in the film with just I think the song was kids playing in the face of nature. And I just thought it was uh, so I was just wondering what, what is what was it like directing like a group of kids like that and just having them have fun like that? Was that challenging or was that more fun than anything? See, the uh, the, the, the actual the songs part of it, uh, the whole credit goes to the choreographer for that. And choreographer two, as pretty much everyone in the film, is a first time choreographer. This is first chance. So he, he teaches dance and everything else. And I gave him everything, my inputs of how, what I used to do as a kid and what we used to play and all those things. And, and then he took all those inputs and then he came about how all these shots have to be composed and all. So in this, I would say major credit was the choreographer and the cinematographer between those two. And mine was third, just passive most of the time for these sequences. And, and the, apart from the three kids, all the kids from, are from the village and they were having fun. <laughs> I just brought the kids, they were playing, they were having fun and they were, they were in the mud and all that, and they just had fun. Uh, they had a blast, and uh, my choreographer and 
the cinematographer, they just captured it. So the three kids, but the three kids, they, it's, it's a very, uh, they have their own story, the, the three kids. The, okay. the protagonist and the two friends, the three friends, these three are not from the village. Everything, everyone else that you see, they're from the village. All the people, he sourced it from, uh, from the village. But these three, they come from a school, it's called social welfare school. So this is, these schools are for, for people who, uh, who are from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. Uh, I mean, the, the, they, they, they come from the lowest strata of the society there. So the government uh, created the schools for them so that they can give free education and all that stuff. So it's more like affirmation kind of thing. So, so typically those schools, when, when I used to grow up and all that, they were, they were not well managed. I mean, they were, they were government funds, which were very meager. So the standard was like, uh, very ordinary and the kids and all that they would not complain because in their homes they would not even get that education or free food right so so for most of the time it was like that but there was one gentleman who came and changed the whole thing and he made them uh, world class and there was actually a movie on him too uh, called uh, Purna it's about a kid who who goes to the Everest and, okay. and and the guy who makes that happen is the guy who reformed all these schools. So what he did was, you no, know, these kids also should have some uh, some performing arts too. So they asked kids who are interested, and they made a school specifically where they can pursue these ones. So that was impossible to even think of for people coming from these sections of the society to even pursue something in while going to school. So luckily, one of my, my cinematographer's assistant, who had a friend there, so he went there, and then he he saw these three kids performing there as part of the regular curriculum in the school, and said, "No, you know these kids, uh, they're talented." I searched everywhere for the kids, nowhere I found it, and and I'm like, my shoot, I I start, I decided that I'll start my shoot on October first, and then I I still don't have kids. I was like struggling. There was my acting coach, who was a very, very nice guy, who went, who came to this village, picked all the people, and then he started training them. But the kids were not able to perform, and the kids from the city, they look uh, urban. They could not perform the accent or the body language of the village kids, and the village kids, they didn't have the confidence to act because that's the first time. Though my acting coach was trying his best, so both ways it was not working out. And luckily, these three kids that I found from there, and they, I, I didn't have to tell them anything. They, they knew their lines. They knew how to frame the scenes. And pretty much everything, they, the, wherever you see the kids part of it, those three, they did it themselves. And, uh, and out of the two, one father drives a lorry or something, and one doesn't have a father and they they come from that background and it's amazing to uh, see them pursue their fine arts and which which i if mean, 20 years back if you ask me like oh from social welfare they would create these kind of acting and performing schools and someone would come out of that i would have laughed at them i would have said impossible and these guys i mean so i was just lucky that someone else put that effort i mean of course the government uh, the as i said the person um, uh, who had that vision and with all their efforts someone made it and luckily uh, and I was the first guy to tap into the potential to okay. uh, take someone from their school and uh, use them in a film and after that now now because people know that okay I got it from that school so they get more opportunities now so whenever people need some kids and all they're going to that fine art school for, for the social welfare from the social welfare school so that that was so so kids was very effortless uh, it was just sheer luck i mean i <laughs> thought i'll have so much problem because as i say for a first timer they said whatever you should not do all those things i did which is <laughs> <laughs> they say never 
do it with kids in your first film because it's so difficult to make them act. It's, it's so difficult to make adults act, forget about kids. So, so don't do that. That's a rule for first time filmmakers not to do. And the second is not to do a period film where you have to show some portions of it in let's say in 1980s, 90s. So don't do those key things because now someone will be with a cell phone or wearing jeans in villages and all, which was not there. So it's tough to get everything right. So don't go period. And okay. there was this, there was a scene with animals in there. There was a snake and all that. We had to delete it. Uh, I mean, it's still on the YouTube where, where there is a real snake. So the set assistants, they brought the guy who specializes in that and he brought a snake and all that. So that was tough to shoot. We didn't, we deleted it because of the length. So they said, they said, don't do it with animals. So we did it with the snake and all that. So there were so many first time directors should not do it. And uh, <laughs> I did that. but luckily I, I managed it. So this, uh, yeah, the, the question about kids is uh, the three kids, so it was effortless, lucky, just got lucky there. Okay, Break, broke all the rules. That's, that's really funny. Now, uh, just, just on the flip side and then I'll let Arpit have a hop back in but just so what was it like casting like the adult Mali Sham and his friends because I thought their camaraderie was like really great yeah so so the casting uh because I was looking for, for the actors uh who can fit into those roles uh but the problem is there are no references for this kind of film so for other films there's a reference like you want to make a a teenage love story or something or rom-com or whatever you go and look in all the previous films and then you say oh this guy was good so let's bring it and for me there was no reference so this particular dialect uh, is very 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 limited to that region and that's not what is used, is used in regular movies so probably very few uh, films are made in this dialect probably I can, it's a handful of films that were made in the history. So, so there is no reference even for a regular film. So this kind of film, it's impossible. So I had no references to bring in. Okay. And uh, uh, one of a friend who was initially associated with the film, he said, how about this guy for the main lead? And he was a comedian and he was acting as a sidekick to the heroes. I said, are you crazy? I mean, in India, uh, or especially the place where I made, it's not that there's a written rule, but they, the audience would not accept a sidekick to be the main hero. I have no clue why, but it's just, it just does not happen. Okay. Every person told me, if you cast him, no one would watch him. He, as a comedian, he, I mean, it's not that he's not the, I mean, he wasn't the number one comedian at the time, but he, there was one movie, his first film, and people remember him for that, that role, that, oh, wow, he, he was very funny in that. But that's about it. The, they don't accept him to be the main hero and in a serious role. They would, they would still will be okay if he does a comedian role throughout the movie, but they cannot accept if it's a main role. I'm not saying it's a rule or something, but that's how it goes. So it's not just okay. one person. Every person told me. But then what happened is I looked into a video uh, uh, where he has put it about when he used to struggle uh, and for people to know him, he put his audition video for some movie he did. And in that, he did a, uh, he was doing various things like, okay, I'll do it something like I'm a fruit seller. Then he says, oh, if I'm a fruit seller and his body language was exactly like the fruit seller. And he would sell and all that stuff and his accent and language and everything. I said, perfect. This guy will suit perfectly to this role. Just be the, the clip of the audition that I watched. I said, he's my guy. Because there could be better actors probably who would have done it, but I don't have the budget to pay them. And, and if I bring him completely an amateur actor, he would not be able to perform such an intense role. So th he was perfect in terms of my affordability and I can see based on his clip that he has put on YouTube for some other movie, the audition clip, 
I knew then he can perform. There is a performer. People are just repeating him as a sidekick or a comedian, or he'll just be in a role and then say some funny things, just be next to the hero, right? So people are not seeing it because they haven't seen this video clip and I have seen it. And it is just some, I was just Googling about him. Like when my friend said, I'm like, are you crazy? But then I said, well, let me give it a thought. Let me search for him. And when I found that clip, I said, he's the guy. Other than that, there was no connection. Uh, I, I didn't know. Just be, And then when I went and approached him, he said, are you serious? <laughs> Making me a hero. I said, yeah. What is the story about? Then he looked at it. I said, this is very interesting. I would love to do it. And that's how it happened. And the other two, they, they did it in a short film. Uh, and the short film was made into a series later. And not many people knew about that thing either. As so I was looking for people who can talk this dialect and who have like some acting chops where, where they're free, they're not rigid. So when I watched this, this uh, their YouTube, this short film that was on YouTube, I said, yeah, I like these guys. And then I called them and that's how uh, those two actors came. So all the three were just based on YouTube on very minor roles, minor content, but I could see their performances that okay. they, you know, they will fit. So I didn't go by their previous history or what they have done, just by what I could look at it. And then I said, oh, this, 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 this will work perfectly for my movie. Awesome. Thank you for YouTube. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> awesome. Arpit, you want to jump into some? Sure. So Raj, which is the philosophy that, you know, has helped you a lot as a storyteller? Most of uh, the stories, I mean, the ones that I wrote earlier or this one or the subsequent ones, I like to draw the inspiration from my own life incidents. So, so if, if, if I can identify with it, then at least some more people like me will identify with it. So at least I have some target audience. So it could be limited, but I know there will be an audience if it, if it comes from real experiences, real life experiences. So even in Malaysia, if you see, if not for his life, if some things happen with his wife and other things, they all come from a personal space, either from me or some other writers or other writers. When it comes from personal space, I think that's where the authenticity comes and pe people can identify with those characters. So identifying it with, with characters, even if it's not great scenes, as long as they're original, I think that will work for a lot of people. And the, those stories will have some audience because there is, you, you can relate to those characters. Of course, there are so many other places where you don't relate to it, but then you try to put into their shoes and look at it. But, but when you identify it directly, there is much more chances to, to connect with the film. So that's what I, I think the, the previous movies and this next one, and even Paka too, for some, to some extent, of course, there is like an uh, underlying whole thing about in each of these things, right? So there is a uh, there's a character arc from beginning to end. There is a message and everything. But mainly, the uh, you can connect with those characters. Uh, so even in Paka, if you look at it, they were very natural. It could be just we could be one of those characters. It could be our own mother or it could be our own son. So that's the the relatability. For, for, for audience with the characters is I think that that connects uh, audience to the stories. That's what I think uh, that I follow. Great. Um, you know, while the film talks about uh, ordinary man with uh, the passion and, you know, despite all the struggle, he tried to achieve something. But one of the aspects that I really loved about the film is that, you know, uh, it breaks certain stereotypes. Like uh, we often heard that, that, you know, men are the strongest one. But I think in the film, more than in Malaysia, uh, the strongest uh, uh, people are the two women, his mother uh, and the uh, villagers uh, and Padma, you know, because the way 
they uh, <clears throat> have supported him, you know, was immense. So while you were crafting the story, you know, uh, did you had all these things in your mind? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, some of the things I, I, I brought from uh, personal experiences, which is, uh, I failed the first time, right? So now I have to attempt the movie second time, right? So the first time, whether it's parents, wife, or someone, they'll say, okay, let him do it for the first time. But the second time, it's not that easy for family to approve it too, right? So how my parents would take it, how my wife would take it. So those are the experiences that I brought in. So as I said, 90% is based on the, 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 the interviews that I did, right? But some of the things I can correlate myself directly to it. I fail at some place. Now I have to prove myself again. So what would my wife say? What would my parents say? And sometimes it's my writer too. He would, his failures, his successes, how his other people around him would react. So how will, will they support or how will the nature of the fights will be? And when it's, uh, there's a disagreement and from their point of view, they are right. From his point of view, it's right. So how do you bring all these things so part of it was from the interviews, but part of it was from the writer's uh, personal experiences. So uh, another part that I really liked in the film is the humor that is in the film, you know, and especially this uh, one character, that neighbor old lady, you know, who keep uh, blabbering one thing or the other. Yeah. So how did you find that humor in the script? Yeah, so, so this neighbor, uh, so the old lady, uh, Actually, there was there were a few more scenes in it. As I said, there is something with the snake and other things. And we had to delete it because of the length of the movie. And she was actually very hilarious in those scenes. Uh, there was two huge sequences. They were like almost like six minutes. And uh, a childhood portion, one scene is there. And then two more scenes where this lady was there. And she's my favorite character. So so when I when I had the thought in my mind, it was two years back. And uh, they, she wasn't famous. She, she is, she's a villager, like a, a daily laborer, right? So she has to go work in the fields, earn. That's what is life. And then he is, uh, and a couple of people from their village started this channel, uh, YouTube channel. And then she used to talk funny. So she they put it in the video, right? And then I, I, I used to watch that. And because I was doing uh, the film in this dialect, I, I, I was searching for this. So then that's how I found them. They were not famous in 2017 when I, when I initially had my mind and when I approached them and all that. And, and this, this is the first movie in which she acted. But in YouTube, the channel from 2017 till when I made the movie, it was slowly growing though. So maybe not huge following, but they had, Towards the end, they had like significant followers. Probably, let's just say, in 2016-17, when I initially thought of casting her, so probably let's just say it was like 50,000, 100,000 kind of thing. But later, it probably like fivefold or maybe more than that. Now they are even huge. But but even when I was making it, they were they were imp they were increasing in popularity. But it's not that a regular filmmaker um, uh, audience will know about him, but people who watch this video channel, they kind of knew about it. She was a rising star in YouTube thing. And then I said, but I wrote it in uh, her character and everyone. And the names of the people also, I got it from that the, those characters who used to be in that YouTube village with the My Village show, their, that's their YouTube channel. And, and when I brought her uh, and I was talking to her, some of the things that that amazes me is that lady used to say like, see, this is how my husband used to hit me after he drinks and all that stuff. And then he died with these deaths and all that stuff. But then the way that she transformed herself, if you think about it from a laborer to now a YouTube star and all that stuff, that's an amazing journey on her own. And, and, and I wanted to do more and more of her. Like I wanted to bring more of her into the story. So it just kept on evolving once I brought her, some of the improvisation, it went on. So, and my, uh, some of the uh, humor, 
part of it was my dialogue writer who who brought in who has a very strong rural uh, connection his his writings and all that stuff so he he brought in a lot of stuff and the crew crew brought in and it it was a very as i said everyone is very so inexperienced so they used to do multiple things my cinematographer was my associate director plus writer so it was like so many people i mean it was a uh, my editor my editor was my associate director too <laughs> so that way so everyone were playing multiple hats even in writing and even in these things and this lady then that, that you brought it up so it was a first film in which she she appeared right but after this film for any kind of this role they cast her not mine was a very small low budget film right after that like all the big budget like the star movies and all that now she's part of those movies can you believe that i mean and she they they, they took her last this year last year to big boss and all that stuff can you imagine a youtube superstar and then she was covered in cnn after that and i'm like wow i mean when we started <laughs> uh, this wasn't it but i'm so glad that not only her all the other actors technicians that worked for this film we were all uh, amateur inexperienced but luckily it's not that this film uh, was a huge hit or something but a lot of people liked it for the quality especially with the constraints that we had that they gave uh, a lot of opportunities and it just got lucky probably for all of us for the filmmaker for filmmaker for me for the crew for my actors and the two friends that you said he is the second one he himself directed a movie and uh, he acted as hero in it and the other character in there is now with uh, alu arjun's movie is next coming so it turned out probably a lucky thing i mean it was all first time for all of us but it it turned out lucky for a lot of the people Oh, cool. I think nice way to uh, summarize it. It will be that you know, if you are trying to make something with, uh, let's say, honesty and simplicity, uh, sooner or later it will pay off. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I've yeah. uh, I've written down my village show for us, our pit. So because I know we probably both want to see more of her. <laughs> the youtube channel <laughs> now i'd love to ask just talking about um first time actors and such i noticed that the woman who plays padma i think her name is ananya nagalia sorry okay. if i butchered that um okay. but how how did you come to cast her for the film I, i really enjoyed her performance in it yeah it was uh, it was interesting though which uh, see the acting coach uh, for this film so he has an institute where he trains people and he he i mean thanks to youtube again someone interviewed him i mean there is a famous uh, person who interviewed him uh and and then he was explaining his process of how he trains his students that one aspect where he said is like oh they'll be just working on something and then they'll keep performing so it's not like they will perform for the camera they'll do something and it's a part of that it's acting is part of what they're already working on something so let's say someone is weaving they are weaving and then they tell their dialogues and all that so that's how the my style of teaching is and that's exactly what i was looking for how i wanted to make the film so i contacted him and he used to help other people with the uh, casting and everything but then i requested him and he wanted a title of director of acting i said yeah done we'll do it that way and he uh, so when his interview was there i thought okay for me my acting coach and everything i'll depend on this gentleman because i liked his views what i have seen on this interview on youtube and this actress has what the same interview and she enrolled in that movie in in his institute just 10 days or 15 days before i went to meet him so there was this interview i watched it and said oh he i would request him to be my acting coach for the film and she watches the interview she was working as a software engineer she worked in short films but then she said okay now i want to dedicate my more time to learn acting 
and she joined there. It was just like a week or so, that's all. So I went there to meet him and he said, hey, I have a good actress. And then I said, okay. Uh, she Actually, she auditioned and she was very urban and her accent doesn't fit into the place where I was making. As I said, okay. 99% of the movies are not made in the dialect in which I have made it. Because okay. it's not, I just wanted to be true to the story, the place where it is done and everything. I didn't want to change it because rest of the film industry, see, for example, here in US, for example, let's say Matthew or someone else who is casted in a film where it is made in the South, the context of it. And if it doesn't talk in the Southern accent, what's the point of making it in that region? So that's something that I like about, about Hollywood is when they go to South, the guys, speaks a southern accent and that's where the beauty of that that region comes out or else i mean they can make it in anywhere uh, so so here i was very clear that i know this isn't popular but i'll make it exactly like this because that is how this gentleman is from that is his, his culture that is his dialect i'll do it even if it's not popular it's okay i'll do it and when i watched this ananya so audition, my acting coach said, oh, just look at her. And she mimicked someone of uh, some performance of another actress from the recent film, which was a huge hit. So when I watched her, I said, even if it, if I take six years, I can't train her on the accent. It's not going to happen. And and what we used in the movie is, is in, in India, they call the sync sound, which is on location sound. So no one makes movies with location sound there, Daniel. So it's all, they just speak something, I mean, closer to whatever it is. And then in the dubbing theater, they'll go and record everything again. Okay. That's, that's the process. 99% of the movies, uh, especially the place where I made it, it's like that. But I wanted on location sound because otherwise it would it will not sound authentic. It will be like someone already spoke and on top of that, the actor is coming and speaking on top of it again. And it's, it's not the same sound that was on location. It's not the same intensity. It's not the same scene. It's not the same performance. It can never be matched. So I, so I said, no, no, no. So if it were dubbing, it would not matter. I can cast anyone in that role and then someone else will speak later with that accent and any mistakes in it, I can cover it. I, then I said, even if I take Six years, I can't uh, get her to speak this dialect. And then second part was, she was mimicking some other actress who, who had a hit in the previous movie, but I'm not blaming her because she has to take something. But then I thought I wanted someone to have their original acting, not someone who can act someone else's role from a movie, right? Okay. The, the, the hero, why I like it, he did not, mimic someone else's acting. He, he took a small portion as if like, okay, I'm a fruit seller. So how will I look like in a fruit seller? So then I'm like, oh, in my movie, the guy sells flowers and fruits. So I exactly want the guy. So that's how I connected with him. And here she was very urban. She was, she didn't have the dialect and she picked someone else's thing. So I said, yeah, let's look at it. And I said, in my mind, no, she's not going to work. And then she, like the role, of course, she saw a few pages of it when she was doing it. And then she knew that, oh, there is some potential to this role. And she was working as a software engineer and she quit the job and she was practicing this role. And after a month or so, uh, the acting coach sends a small video of her. And for other auditions, they were using her as the Padma character and she was getting good at it. And she was putting effort to learn it. And then I said, this is amazing. I want someone who can take this challenge and do it. Because every, any other actor in her shoes, they would have said, give me the role, then I'll quit my job, and then I will practice it. But here, she's someone who said, no, I'll quit my job now. I'll get full time into this, and I'll improve it. And then I'll show you how, it, how I can transform myself. And that attitude, which clinched it, I said, perfect if she can do give this much of uh, effort and dedication i'm all set and that's exactly what happened she when she came to the sets she 
she just concentrated on her work and nothing else and then in the free time she would talk to the other villagers she would pick the body language from them the accent from them and he aced it so that was the history of the lead actress oh brilliant and I, i've got to say i appreciate the attention to detail for the sound because i feel like i'm a bit of a sound nerd <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I, I need I need good sound. So that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Now, I'd also love to ask um, just about the weaving in the film. Did some of the actors have to learn how to do that? Or Absolutely. what was that like? Absolutely. So there was this gentleman who, uh, I mean, my art director himself comes from that community of weavers. So he was very well versed with the art design of it, how it should look like, right? So we went directly into the houses. So whatever the houses of weavers were, we went and shot there. So there are no artificial sets or something, right? And then, and then there is a there is a rhythm. There is a rhythm to it how you do. Okay, there is a rhythm to how your hands should flow, and sure. and there is a pit where you sit, and then there is a pedal kind of thing. So the half of it, you don't see it because they're sitting like this, but have, their legs are, legs are inside the pit, okay? okay? So it's like pedaling kind of thing. Their legs are doing the half the work and then here the hands, and one hand should do this and the other hand should go forward. And then there's a rhythm, it should come. So, so I was very particular for the, for the hero to learn that rhythm and get that thing correctly, the father, you know, and when the actresses do the other aspect of it, which is the the design comes from there. So when they move the hands, there is a particular rhythm to it. So, so I was very particular about it. I had someone to monitor this and help them fix it. And, and I was very particular because it, unless you weave, how can you, uh, so he, so the hero, he spent a few nights working with the actual weaver and then he wove a part of it then i said okay now i can bring you into the frame to weave because you will look like a weaver now so it doesn't have to be 100 percent, but you, you have to weave something so he <laughs> wove like a, a piece a piece of the sari and then i said okay now we can bring it bring you into the start so that's how it happened okay and was it like difficult to like create that like replica of the machine that he creates I don't know if I'm making sense here. <laughs> no, you did probably, but I didn't fully understand. Sorry. Can you repeat that, Daniel? Oh, just the like how he has that object, like the machine right. to, sure. to, to make it easier for weaving. Was it difficult to actually make that prototype for the film? Oh, no, we, sorry. Oh, that, that's okay. That one, it, we, what we did was we actually requested Mr. Malaysia to help us give all the different prototypes. Oh, great. So, okay. So he went back, the wooden thing that he made, of course, he doesn't have it now, but he made the wooden thing again for us. So, okay. so there were challenges to the wooden thing, how to use it, and the thread snap on the wooden part, and somehow we managed it. And then the first version of it comes. So his original first version of it, we had to bring that because the subsequent ones, the design changed and it went to electronic. So he didn't have the manual mechanical one. So it was it was two shifts from the wooden thing was the first part of the prototype. Then he comes with the mechanical thing. Then at later point of time, he comes with the electronic thing and everything changed electronic. But the mechanical thing, whatever he made it, we brought it and then we fixed it. It wasn't working. So then I had an electrician who had the knowledge of uh, that previous machine because he worked with them. So he was on the set to make it work, to fu- make it functional because this was like a 10, 20 year old one, okay. the older one. So, yeah. but luckily, yeah, it was a challenge to get all these things right, but it was uh, Mr. Malaysian who helped with us. Okay, awesome. That's so cool that you were able to, he was able to help with that. <laughs> yeah, cool. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, Arpit, do you wanna have, do you have any more? Yeah, sure. Okay. So I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have seen one more film that, you know, revolves around the handloom viewers and everything, uh, Suman by Sham Benegal. So did it help you anyway to form your vision for this film? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I watched uh, Susman and uh, actually there was no print available. So I had, I had to struggle to watch it. Did you watch the movie, Alfred? Yeah, 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 I have watched the film. 
when I watched it, I was amazed at the detailing that Mr. Benegal did, which is uh, the finer aspects of the community. I mean, how they eat the food, they pour the water after that and how they get up. I mean, he was exactly, he, I mean, the research that Mr. Benegal, Benegal, Sham Benegal did, it's amazing, the attention. I, I don't know if, how many people would have even noticed it, but to how they put this one, how they wear it, how they wear the clothes, it was like exact, I mean. So that was inspiration in, in a way to get things right. Okay. So that was definitely the inspiration. And uh, the storyline is, is somewhat different. So there wasn't much inspiration for that, but the authenticity to the weaving this thing and uh, the other aspects of it, yes, it definitely, it, it was inspiration. And the next thing was, uh, one thing that I took from the movie is, there is a prayer by Kabir called the, the Genie Genie song, right? It's an amazing song. And uh, I loved it so much that for writing also, it used to inspire me so much, that Kabir's song. And uh, the music director, who passed away recently, is extra, um, not getting his name, but he's extraordinarily talented music director. Uh, Yes, it's in my, and I'm not, uh, oh boy. But, but he, the tune that he used was so amazing. And the lyrics, of course, Kabir wrote it. So who can write better than Kabir, right? So, but this was not the Doha. He, it, this is a poem of Kabir. So I wanted something like that in, in the movie too. Uh, so Daniel, to give you the background about it, Kabir is, He's a philosopher, he's a very uh, amazing philosopher from probably like 1500 or some around that time frame. I don't know the exact time frame, but like five, 600 years back. And he was a weaver. Amazing part is that philosopher, he himself was a weaver. And cool. he used to write the poetry and everything in a very normal life because he was a normal guy, a weaver. And he wrote this poem in which he equates the, the handloom and the whole handloom and the making of a, a, a sari or a cloth or anything to how the creator would weave a, a, a baby out of the blood and nerves and all that stuff. So that's how he wrote the poem. Uh, so, so the, I was desperate, like I was like, I wanted something like that during my titles and everything. So I tried so many lyricists, it did not work out, but luckily my dialogue writer wrote that. And I, I would say it's one of the best parts of the movie. Unfortunately, I gave the subtitles to Netflix. I don't know why they didn't add it. When the thing comes, maybe it would have clashed with the titles. They would have removed it. I don't know the reason. But it's such a profound story, profound song, which comes in the titles. And that was the inspiration. Sussman was the imp inspiration. Sorry, to answer your question, yeah. you haven't uh, all around, but that was the uh, inspiration from Sussman. Sure. So uh, uh, I think, Raj, you are a movie buff yourself, you know, and uh, I'd love to know this one part from you that uh, what cinema has uh, changed in you as a person? Uh, I think around 99, uh, when I came to US and I watched, I had access to watch so many movies and from libraries, so from Santa Clara Library, I used to get this, all this world cinema, like uh, uh, Kurosawa, the Iranian films, and so much of access I got, it when I watched all these movies, my knowledge about world, thought process, uh, thinking, everything evolved, I would say, from cinema. So whatever very rigid notions about life, about philosophy, about thinking, everything was whatever it was taught to me. So I was a very 
narrow-minded individual till I discovered so many different movies. It, it, it helped me look at life with, from so many different perspectives. So I could say, oh, in Japan, someone made it in, this is about a story about someone. Uh, some other particular time, oh, this is a story about X, Y, Z. And the Iranian cinema, I never knew Iranian cinema existed. And, and for example, I have, for example, before watching it, I would have had some opinion about how Iranian people would live or look like. But when I watch it, I'm like, oh, wow, this is so much of different thing than what I used to think. How the Japanese think, how the Italian think, how the Korean think. So filmmaking helped me become much broad-minded. So I was like just very narrow-minded before I was exposed to all these movies and very limited uh, perspective to life. And this watching other movies, they, it really broadened my perspective, my, my whatever I now look at things, I'm like, oh, that's another perspective. This is another perspective that I actually learned and help me broaden my perspective. I think it might have been what we were just talking about a bit ago, but can you talk about what went into choosing like the music in general for the film? Yeah. So the music, uh, uh, I had what, I mean, at the time, I think my music director, uh, he did like probably one film, one film I think he did, uh, if I'm not wrong. And uh, everyone else, as I said, they didn't do even one film, including me. I mean, I produced a movie and wrote a movie, uh, but I didn't direct it. But, I, but he was the one who made one film. So he was better than all of us. So I went with him. And this story, no one believed in it. Like uh, a lot of the actors, crew, even after joining the film, I would not blame them because they have their own ideas, right? So when they would have written, read the script, they would have imagined a different way. When I'm, the way that I'm making, it could be completely different. So they would be like, oh, what the hell is Raj doing, right? Oh, there's a good story, <laughs> he's messing it up. So the crew, cast, everyone had a had lot of doubts. My acting coach, my art director, and some people, they said, no, 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 it's going good. So it was mixed reaction from my crew and cast. But music director from the beginning is like, Raj, this is going to be a good film. So he, he, he didn't just stick to just the music part of it. He would discuss about, oh, how about that? How about this? Oh, it's a good scene. So we, we, we became very good friends, actually, the music director, Mark and me. Okay. And, and some of the references were mine. For example, as I said, in the village, when I saw this music thing, right? So I said, oh, this, I would like to have this music there. Uh, because I've seen how intense this whole, it's, it's called the Muharram thing. And the uniqueness about this particular religion is it's celebrated by Hindus and Muslims. And I had no clue, though I'm part of that region, I had no clue that, I mean, I had fair idea, but I didn't witness it first time. So when I would check out, oh, I'll use this, I'll use the same music, I'll use the same song, what they're singing. So there is no ownership for that music or song because these are folk songs, they come from people. So there, in those places, I had the inputs about how I would like to have them. And then uh, another was, uh, there was a famous poet and his song, it was not in movies or anywhere. I listened, I heard it somewhere and I loved it so much. And it, it described the movie in a nutshell. So I said, oh, this is what is the movie is about and this is doing it. I want to use it in movie. And the title song, as I said, the Kabir, that was my idea. So these few were my ideas where I wanted exactly how I wanted it in different parts of it. And the rest of it is all the music director where he would say, let's have something like this. So all the background score, it, he, I gave him the free run, he did it. But there were a few places where the feedback was like, oh, here probably it's not that good. Not that. So then I requested him, then he changed it. And finally, uh, whatever he did for the background and all, I think I, I really liked the music. So some parts where I was very clear, I said, no, Mark, I want exactly this song here. I want the title song like this. I want the other poet, which summarizes the whole movie. It's, it, it summarizes the whole movie in one, one paragraph. So I would want it there. And 
some of my those were my input but rest everything was the music director and we shared a, a lovely relationship so we became a friend and for my next film also more than music he would say oh this story will work so so he has a much broader understanding of what works what doesn't work and he's just not just restrictive to music so that's that really helped me i mean he was such a moral booster when people were very skeptical uh, oh this will not work and he would say no no raj i mean Yeah, hit money i don't i can't say but this will work believe me so it was a very uh, like a very moral boosting help uh, from the music director you had mentioned earlier how uh, for the scene with the kids you kind of let the choreographer and cinematographer handle that scene but like were there any were, was that the case for most of the music kind of interludes or did you handle like some of them like maybe the the romantic more romantic scene when they first get to the city see the 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 whole children's song it was a choreographer uh, okay i gave the inputs of what needs to be done but how the designing shots the exact cutting of the shots everything was the choreographer for that song okay. and uh, and some of the small small things come which is the buzz and those kind of things th- those i took care of myself but there is this pregnancy thing where where he he feeds her and all that stuff where where he has to temporarily stop because his wife is pregnant so those moments also were captured by the choreographer okay so he he said oh how about uh, he is doing his work and she will be lying on the bed and watching it so a few of those shots were also his idea and he cut them ah okay okay interesting so cool everywhere else was just normal because it was just part of there was not much of the this thing and some of the shots we ourselves shot like when we were passing from one location to another so i let them be in some place and just with some sheep or something like that and i used all those shots later on as a montage so those were all uh, our crew and me we did it ourselves but the kid song was the main and then uh, towards the end then when she's pregnant he would feed her and all that a few of those shots were his 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 own this thing okay very collaborative either way very, very, like. very collaborative okay and my last one was just I I want um I'm just going to look at my questions for this one. The Mali Sham, he crashes a vehicle at one point and I don't think I've ever seen like a car crash quite like it, which I thought was like it was very unique. Can you just talk about how you kind of put together those shots for that scene where is kind of I think it's called a tuk tuk flips over? Yeah, the tuk tuk uh, the auto rickshaw flips over, right? So yeah. so this is a good example of what is the real life scene and what's the what's the actual scene and what's the fiction right so when he narrated to me he said raj you know what one day uh this uh, i was like uh, using this tuk tuk but this is a slightly modified tuk tuk right which which carries the goods in the back instead of the passengers so sure. it's called the load carrier or something like that so it's 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 still a tuk tuk the front part of it is just the back part of it they modify it so that they can carry goods right and they put they put so much of it and he said my tuk tuk was a very old one and there is, in india we have the speed breakers right like where is a bump it will stop there to reduce the speed of the people right he yeah. said everything was going fine raj but it was slightly slopy and i was going through the slope and then when it hit the speed breaker and then it flipped and and because of the weight i was in the air and because of the this thing so i was hanging in the air and all these traffic people the near all the people around the street they came and then they had to bring me down okay, okay. so this was what he described right which was the actual incident this is how it happened so because of the load he's hanging in the air the the back tires the back two tires they they are like this and the front tire is is in the air and he's hanging in the air and he said raj i was very scared that day but luckily all these people came running and they brought it down 
and then they helped me uh, uh, settle down. So, so then I was thinking like, how do I shoot them, right? So I thought, okay, I'll do very similar. And uh, but because there is slight risk involved, then I called the stunt, stunt people because okay. I didn't want to take a risk here. So when the stunt, uh, I mean, in India, we call them the fight master, okay? The choreographer okay. is the dance master, the stunts guy is called the fight master. So the fight master came and he's a very experienced guy. This is a very small thing for the other movies that he do. Because as I said, in the films that we actually do, there are people flying around, there are vehicles flying around. That's their main action thing, which is very unrealistic, but that's what people like and that's how it happens. So he came and said, Raj, uh, I can do, uh, make this dramatic. I can make it an accident. I can, uh, I can, Let's, I can bring a crane, I can do that, I can do this. And then I'm like, sir, I don't have the budget. Okay, with some budget, we'll manage something. And then we changed that scene of, initially the, the, it was closer to reality and it was just like, okay, it will be in the air and then he falls down or something like that. And with sound, we will manage and we'll bring him to the hospital. That was the plan. But when he came, so he brought a small crane and then he lifts it and then he drags it and he added the defects and all. That's why the making of it, you will see, it's slightly different than the rest of the scenes because, and, and this one, it's, it's, see when I uh, do these kind of scenes, so I have something in mind, I tell and I take a back seat. So everything is controlled by the fight master. So the shot, how he wants to design it. I already tell him approximately. And from there, how he slightly changes it and his thing, it's, it, that shot is his shot. So he, he cuts it, I mean, he says the start, he says the cut, everything designs it. So that's how I, that, that was a one day shoot we had to do and that's how he did it, the fight master. Okay, very interesting. Awesome, I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> Arpit, did you have the last one? Sure, uh, so that we have interacted you for a while now, you know, and one thing I can clearly say with this interaction that, you know, you seem like a, like a person who is deep and mature with his thoughts, you know. Uh, so I would love to know this one thing that, you know, uh, what are the parameters that you set uh, for the success uh, as an individual as well as, uh, as a filmmaker? Uh, I mean, filmmaking, uh, I personally think in India, it, it, it's, it's very risky and very few people will be able to make it because let's say you join as an assistant director how many assistant directors will get the chance to make a film? In my case, I mean, I was lucky where I got a delayed start, but I got some start at some point of time, 2007, because of whatever I saved, I could put it back and all that, but not many people have the opportunity, right? But so it's, 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 it's you got to be very tough if you want to enter or else I personally think you should not enter Indian film industry or probably, it's the same for everywhere else, but because I have done three films in India, so I know slight, a little bit about it, not much. So you should not enter it. If you're, it's not for the faint hearted, I would say. It's, you got to be so strong mentally, like, and you should tell yourself that I'll enjoy the filmmaking process in whichever way it is. And that itself is my, I'll enjoy the journey. And if something else happens, that's a bonus. Only if you have the, this particular mentality, I think you got to enter it or else you will be disappointed because not everyone will be able to make a film. Not everyone, I mean, chances are, you, chances are high if you put in the effort, but the path is so arduous. It will take a long time. It could take five years, 10 years. So someone who has the energy to sustain for such long, five years, 10 years should come. But the thing is, it's still rewarding because a day on the set, whatever you do, let's say you're a cinematographer's assistant or a cinematographer or anything, it's, it's a very creative process in which you can contribute. And it's rewarding to see whatever work that you have, you have done translated to something on the set. My art director, uh, he's, he's, he's not a regular art director, he's an artist, right? So I had to depend on all the assistant, direct, assistant art directors for the day-to-day -day stuff, right? 
So there is one guy who who is an artist. I was no clue, but he's from those villages, and he will he will, he worked on it. So pretty much, and there was a slightly senior another uh, associate art director who had some film industry. So he would drive most of the things, but I would depend on this this guy who's coming first time on the set, and like oh draw a peacock, and he would draw the peacock, which I would use it, and and please can you please bring me that set? So all this he did it. Now if you think about it. he didn't have any formal education in art he he had a slightly bent of painting that's all it is and he was working hard on the set and then if i were him i would feel proud right the i mean i'll feel proud that something i drew something i created it i'm seeing it in the screen right that's the mentality someone should have and then i mean if some if someone is lucky it will be a shorter time but if someone isn't lucky it will take time but that mental i mean that strength someone should have to wait work hard and to finally they'll see the results but it it's a it's a tough it's a tough path some some guys will get lucky right i mean first film second film but those are exceptions but i would say majority of the people who don't have godfathers or anything in any field <laughs> art cinematography and all those things especially in india it's it they will succeed but it'll take time so whoever has the strength to uh be in that marathon they'll succeed so that 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 that's what i feel i mean i i learned from the three films that i made i think i I'll, I'll, i'll ask the last this question and then i think we can wrap it up sounds good uh so uh you know uh, uh i think i just uh, this question just hit on my uh, hit on my mind when you were just said your last line you know so you have made this film that you know uh, while we have interacted you have shared us the experiences that has went behind it and also the behind story of what made you choose this project again and everything so i mean uh, let's say the film has been made you have received the good feedbacks and everything but yet you know maybe it has not uh, got the let's say same accomplishment that uh, other films would have received you know so how as a as a person or let's say as a storyteller you keep yourself motivated you know towards your next project yeah as i said uh, arpit this movie i i did not recover my cost uh, from malaysia so i lost some money so but as i said even to recover part of the money it itself is a bonus so the way my approach in my second film was i'll enjoy the journey i'll enjoy each and every step of it so let's say the writing process uh pre production process of living in that village day to day life in the village day to day activity uh, like you form such deep friendships with the crew and the cast you argue and everything but you are building bonds around it so all those are memorable experiences so that itself is your reward so that that journey itself is a reward when the movie gets completed that is a bonus when someone says they like the movie that's the second bonus when you recover the money that's the third bonus so that's how i look at it the films and not many people can afford to do that because there are huge budgets in it but that's why i want to keep my story simple uh, where there is still a risk uh, i i can't afford to lose that much money but it's still very small budgets simple stories so i can still follow the same same uh, equation of enjoying the process and not worrying too much about the the results i would love to have those bonuses but even otherwise uh when the journey is pleasant it's it's worth all the effort and money that you put in it i i think it's a awesome uh, thought for sure cool cool now raj do you have we know i know that we talked about before that you don't have much social media but do you have like a website you wanted to plug or just uh or people could find the film which i i'm pretty sure is netflix in yeah, most of the world it's in netflix correct Okay. Do does the film have a website or anything? No, the film doesn't have a website. <laughs> Stay anonymous. <laughs> cool. Well, we are uh, on the podcast, but yeah, we just wanted to thank you Raj for taking so much time on your Saturday and talking 
with us about the film. It's it's been a lot of fun. Oh, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you so much, Arpit, and and I'm glad uh, we did this. Uh, yeah. And, and thank you so much, uh, Daniel and Arpit.